Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience. This is the fifth episode of the virtual symposium Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation. We are the Critical Computation Bureau, a collective of researchers, artists and writers working at the intersection of technology and culture, computer science and information theory, aesthetics and politics. Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation 2020 aims to provide interventions in the technopolitics of racial capitalism and its recursive regeneration, mixing together critical and creative practices and borrowing models and methods from the philosophy of technology, black studies, political theory, computer science and information theory, media aesthetics and cultural and media theories. Please check our manifesto on the website www.recursivecolonialism.com and the special issue Control Societies at 30 published online in social text. We would like to thank Duke University, which has sponsored this symposium together with the University of Pennsylvania and l'Università di Napoli L'Orientale. For more information on this project or to contact us, feel free to check out our website www.recursicolonialism.com and to follow our socials. My name is Tiziana Terranova. My co-facilitator today is Oana Parvan. We call this fifth day of the symposium Machine Aesthetics and Asset Capital and we've accompanied today's dialogue with an exclusive music set by Code9. The set will premiere on YouTube in two hours. The format of this session will be the following. Our guests will both talk for 20 minutes each, then 10 minutes each. After that, the speakers will address a few questions that you can type into your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please remember to state clearly which speaker your question is addressed to. Our co-facilitator will pick up as many questions as possible and the chair will address them to the panelists. I also want to remind all panelists not to check the Q&A box, as all questions will be verbally asked by the chair. Please type in your question in the Q&A box at any time of the session. This session is also streamed live on, the, on our YouTube channel. The first two episodes are already up and the following an, uh, ones will be up soon. Today, uh, we are very proud to host a dialogue between our guests Steve Goodman and Luciana Parisi. Steve Goodman is an artist, writer, and under the name of Code9, an electronic musician. He founded the record labels Hyperdub in 2004 and Flatlines in 2019. He has produced three albums, two with the late vocalist The Space Ape, Memories of the Future in 2006, and Black Sun in 2012, and one solo album, Nothing, 2015. His book, Sonic Warfare, was published in 2009 by the MIT Press, and in 2019, he co-edited Audit, Unsound, Undead, for the Urbanomic Press. He co-runs the monthly event series Zero, and his installations have appeared at, among other venues, such as the Tate Modern, the Barbican, an Arbeit Gallery in London, and CAC in Shanghai. Luciana Paris' research is a philosophical investigation of technology and culture and aesthetics and politics. She's a professor in media philosophy at the Programme in Literature and the Computational Media Art and Culture at Duke University. She's the author of Abstract Sex, Philosophy, Biotechnology and Mutations of Desire, published in 2004 by Continuum Press, and Contagious Architecture, Computation, Aesthetics and Space, 2013 MIT Press. She's completing a monograph on alien epistemologies and the transformation of logical thinking in computation. Welcome to you both and over to Steve and Luciana. Thank you, Tiziana. Uh, I'd just like to thank the Critical Computation Bureau um, for this invitation and the opportunity to, to kind of resume a conversation with Luciana that's been going on for at least 20 years. Um, so today I want to focus on a 
couple of things. Um, a persistent, uh, I want to focus on a persistent myth that continues to haunt ideas of machine aesthetics. And I'll then move on to reflect on certain, a certain description of a mode of inhuman sonic intelligence which pre-existed recent innovations in machine learning and discuss or maybe reflect on its degrees of complicity with subsumption within um, science fiction or preemptive capital. So I want to start with um, what emerged as some side notes to a sound installation that I designed in 2018, 2019 entitled It which revolved around the myth of the golem for the exhibition AI More Than Human at the Barbican in London. It mapped how recent preoccupations with AI are still haunted by creatures of old Kabbalistic tales. Um, what follows navigates between um, the theologians of the singularity and team human. Section one is called Spectres of the Golem. In Mamori Oshii's Innocence, 2004, the sequel to Ghost in the Shell, Public, sector, uh, public Security Section 9 is tasked with investigating a series of murders committed by hacked gynoids, or robots with a female form, that killed their owners and then inexplicably committed suicide. Prompted by Major Kusanagi's holographic messages, Section 9 Agent Batu recalls Jacob Grimm's 1808 retelling of the myth of the golem. A clay figure sculpted in the image of man is brought to life through Kabbalistic ritual in order to serve its human master, and then proceeds to run amok. Batu describes how, in order to activate the golem, the word emet, or Hebrew for truth, is inscribed upon its forehead. By removing the first letter so that the word becomes met, meaning dead, the android is deactivated. The most famous account of the myth of the golem as a body without soul originates in the Jewish community 16th century Prague, where it was created to protect the ghetto from outside threats. Even earlier appearances can be found in the Old Testament, in other versions of the myth, the golem, a rule-following artificial entity, was created through ecstatic ritual and incantations revolving around the vocal recitation of combinations of Hebrew letters and numbers, literally breathing life into it. So here we have an inanimate body animated by sound. The golem myth proposes a crude hardware, clay, software, word, number, model. It's either a speech activated machine or one switched on and off with a passcode which stirs the otherwise lifeless figure. The myth preposes a sequence of events. Creation from dead matter to a creature as slave, companion, protector and then loss of control and destruction or deactivation of the artificial being. Innocence, Ghost in the Shell 2, once again summons the golem, a revenant spectre that continues to haunt humanity's Promethean dreams of self-overcoming. The golem myth is often invoked in discussions of the usually theological drive of transhumanists to transcend human form. This foreboding parable has endured as a warning about the hubris of the quest for immortality and has become synonymous with apocalyptic AI the fear of the replacement of humans by machines. From Frankenstein to the founder of cybernetics, Norbert Wieler's infamous God and Golem, um, through to Joanna Ghost in the Shell, Ex Machina, and so on, its hold over the modern, modern imagination runs deep. The Golem suggests a kind of technological animism that accompanies the increasing automation of life. While Innocence deploys the myth to bolster the dramatic arc of the cyborg in the film, the notion of the golem as runaway AI is perhaps best rendered in Stanislav Lem's short story Golem 14. So in the interzone between science and myth, 
Mark Fisher invoked the concept of the Gothic flatline, which he described as a plane where it's no longer possible to differentiate the animate from the inanimate, and where to have agency is not necessarily to be alive. There are many kinds of persons in the world, he suggests, only some of whom are human. On the Gothic flatline, the golem conjures an acoustic cyberspace as a demonology of artificial intelligence. Tool, slave, collaborator, or nemesis. The golem has become a cipher for technological danger. While a killer drone or a vengeful, a vengeful gynoid poses an obvious threat, threat to life, what menace does the golem bring when dropped into musical ecosystems? What does this cipher for AI apocalypse convey about music? What is a musical threat or a threat to music? Its final erasure through the coupling of AI and Neuralink systems? A musical instrument that plays its player? A database of music autonomous from listeners? Was what we thought of as music merely a side effect of a long-term formalization that will replace humans through automation? Do these threats demand an installation of an Asimovian charter for music? While algorithmic musical systems subsume and embed a great deal of human labor, some argue that musical simulations can already pass the Turing test. Section two, artificial acoustic agencies. Set against these melodramatic scenarios, it's worth remembering that in most versions of the myth, the golem was created to protect the community from which it was spawned. Moreover, instead of musical automation being a potential vibe killer, it's worth recalling the words of Kojo Eshin when he reminded us that, quote, the way science is used in music in general is as a science of intensified sensation. In the classic two cultures of mainstream society, science is still the science that drains the blood of life and leaves everything vivisected. But in music, it's never been like that. Rather, he points to a sonic science that departs from a musical humanism, nurtures accidents and invents the unknown. Beyond retromanically repeating musical styles as ostensibly statistical averages of past musical material, in other words, recent AI experiments with produce, replicating music in the style of a pre-existing uh, musical aesthetic, the golem could be a repository of unsound, a carrier of a music to come. For many, the apocalyptic version of the musical automation story has already been superseded by a more symbiotic model in which human music is augmented, upgraded by its engagement with, for example, machine learning, promising untold inhuman collaborators. Rather than merely an anti-Promethean warning, this augmented music augmented music already fosters new kinships between humans and non-humans. In a musical ecosystem, the golem is an artificial acoustic agency. Still embryonic at the moment, future art artificial musicians may comprise of speech synthesis modules, machine learning, machine listening, intelligent signal processing, and the formal modeling of musical behavior. Such a system of algorithmic composition based on chance, rule-based or AI systems which learn and create their own rules, may themselves in integrate an internal automated critic as a sorting and selection tool. AI research on music has two sometimes combined tendencies, the symbolic outputting of score information and the sub-symbolic sound, sound synthesis. While taking advantage of advanced processing and sound generation potential, such systems to date have usually required supervision by humans, who provide the data sets from which the systems learn and retain the roles of coordination and cherry picking of musical behavior. Rather than reducing human input, rather than taking the human out of the loop, these techniques integrate humans into supposedly non-hierarchical systems of improvisation and curation. Section three, ghost dubbing. 
Towards the end of Innocence, Batu discovers that the killer gynoids have been hacked and ghost upped, making them seem more human. In the terminology of Ghost in the Shell, the ghost is what differentiates the human from an artificial person. Yet the dubbing procedure is illegal and destroys the human mind from which it's copied. If musical golems like the gynoids in Innocence acquired their own voice, must they then commit suicide to offset the assassination their existence indicates, using their newfound autonomy to decry their own superhuman musicality? As wholesome as the augmentation of human music, uh, as the augmentation of human musicality may sound, the outcome, programmed or accidental, may not be fully comprehensible within currently available schemas. This opens up an exciting promise of a monstrous potential to create work of, to create work in excess of, and perhaps even hostile to any human aesthetic designation. Does an automated musical system really need to be ghost dubbed for its contribution to be considered musically significant? While in most versions of the myth, the golem is mute, it's hard not to sense its spectre within the proliferation of embryonic speech activated virtual AI assistants chained to menial domestic tasks. What might, these, what might the progeny of these rudimentary intelligences do once liberated from human servitude? How might, how might their currently elementary sonic responsiveness evolve? Drawing from other sightings of the golem in pop science, in culture, in science and pop culture, the insulation it toyed with some of these questions using near inaudible voices to um, using near inaudible voices from mal malfunctioning text to speech systems beamed into highly directional speakers. It probed the liminal space between internal voices and those dubbed in from the outside. While musical augmentation by AI is often promoted as a co-evolution between humans and non-human agents, the machine is still essentially being domesticated and humanized. In Innocence, if the hack killer gynoids had not been dubbed with a human ghost, in the first place they would have remained innocent. They wouldn't have killed their owners. Towards the end of the film, Major Kusanagi, already a, a ghost, adrift in the Matrix, mused that, quote, if the dolls had voices, they would have screamed, I did not want to become human. Section four, Black Atlantean Future Rhythm Machine. Now I want to contrast this idea of the out of control golem that not just threatens its human master, perhaps, but perhaps tries to refuse the model of the master-slave dialectic with some of the ideas of Kojo Eshin in his late 90s text, More Brilliant Than the Sun, where he is already using a terminology which may or may not coincide with at least some of the concepts at stake in Luciana's research into Zeno patterning. Specifically, Kojo Eshin proposes a sonic fiction of the Black Atlantean future rhythm machine. One could argue that this fiction stages, makes audible, some of the chrono crises of recursive colonialism within the simultaneously forwards, sideways, and counterflows of its time signatures. The Black Atlantean future rhythm machine assumes the role of a distributed, decentralized artificial intelligence engaged in essential mathematics that simultaneously abstracts, affects, and concretizes cognitions, that calculates movement and moves calculation. Composed in part by the vernacular mathematics of black musical sociality, his temporal and sonic coding systems motivate the flesh and constitute an animated diagram for a set of anti-gravity craft that nav to navigate the weight of the present. The future rhythm machine is composed of both analog and digital computational systems, parallel countercultures in the numerical sense of counting intermodulating across time zones. Composed of localized continua and infrastructural cl clouds, each musical ecosystem is both generated by and generates the local population's rate of vibration 
neural entrainment, and fuzzily calculate and adjust their movements. The various regional electronic scenes and their servers and local area networks provide the concrete detail of this central calculus. Internetworked, each locale enters into loose asymmetrical synchronization. Their collective intelligence is an amalgam of individual auteurs, genius, and faceless movements, seniors, but their inventiveness exceeds the summation of any individuals swept up by its inhuman agency. Kojo Eshin noted that one of the key tasks of the future is to understand rhythmic intelligences and hyperrhythmic music as something that's happening to us that we can't yet understand, that we can only begin to grasp. It's one step ahead, with each step producing a theoretical advance. Quote, it's cleverer than you and me. It's always wrong footing you. Patterns are unresolved, incomplete, indefinite. Rhythm for Eshin does not just activate a pre-organized body centralized around their head, but rather synthesizes bodily intelligence limb by limb. Quote, anywhere you have that sense of tension, that's the beginning, that's the signs of a bodily intelligence switching on. It proceeds by amplifying this tension, possessing and dispossessing you, constituting a collective exoskeleton. Bemoaning both the racist tendency to essentialize and naturalize rhythm and to retreat into the ineffable when confronted by describing it, Eshin describes, Eshin instead offers a biological, a biotechnical account. Rhythm is a thought wear the interfaces between the wet and the hard. In more brilliant, the Black Atlantean future rhythm machine is a Zeno intelligence. Against naturalization and innateness, it contacts you from the outside, not from within. Eshin pauses and inverts the conventional anthropocentric conception of music history, attributing agency also to the non-human components of cultural networks. The future rhythm machine is a diasporic synthetic intelligence, but it describes not merely the electronic continuation of vibrant traditions of African polyrhythm and musical cultures networked for the 21st century. It also entails a complicity with and navigation within predatory computational networks in a planet, a planetary extra human scale. It dramatizes the synthesis between the innovations of black musical sociality and their automation. For the future rhythm machine, all musicians, all listeners, all dancers, all researchers, all academics, all journalists, all programmers are merely sense organs, search algorithms, processing units on this network. The South London artist actress thinks he built his, stereo, his studio robot AZD, while the future rhythm machine thinks it deployed him as an advanced servo mechanism to own and be owned by the means of vibration. More recently, more recently, actress has collaborated with an AI named Young Paint, which he describes as a system trained on his own music that he outsources labor to. In the stack, Benjamin Bratton is referred to a mega machine of planetary computation composed of nested systems which include earth, cloud, city, address, interface, and user. They're simultaneously demarcated and segmented into zones of sovereign power. In conjunction with the Dutch artist Metahaven, Bratton names the stack's relation to futurity is potential <coughs> as the black stack, or to quote them, computational totality to come, defined at this moment by what it is not, by the empty content fields of its framework and by its dire inevitability. It's not the platform that we have, but the platform that might be. The platform would be defined by the productivity of its accidents and by the strategy for which, for which whatever may appear at first as the worst option, even evil, may ultimately be where to look for the best way out. It's less a possible future than an escape from the present, end of quote. 
I would like to uh, bastardize and repurpose this concept of the black stack as a shadow of the future by forcing a conjunction with the sonic field of the future rhythm machine. We're used to, for example, understanding the Black Atlantic following Paul Gilroy as a rhizome, a horizontal decentralized network. But it's also distributed through a vertical, modular technological architecture of platforms, both hardware and software. The stacks and platforms of science fiction capital, the preemptive capitalism, complicates and accelerates the advances of the future rhythm machine. In sonic fiction, the black stack is a liquid computer, a motherboard and the key engine of global pop music. The history of popular music in the West is simultaneously a story of the automation of the Black Atlantic, the uploading of the algorithmic processes that compose musical cultures into the algorithms of digital software. The history of musical automatons and Western formalist musicology, stretching back centuries, culminates in the stack. This visual software integrated and automated the techniques of early Soviet avant-garde cinema, music software encodes centuries of knowledge and technique. While it's a stack that has made possible the democratization and decentralization of the music industry, it also employs, it also deploys AI to design your listening habits through automated playlists, preempting and programming your desire like a kind of parametric architecture of taste. The stack also catalyzes a predatory culture of algorithmic racial profiling that through prediction forecloses the future. To what extent can, tem can contemporary music cultures um, only be understood both through their complicity with these predatory predictive computational networks and what unidentified audio objects, or perhaps in Luciana's terms of reference, alien intelligences, can they give rise to and what is their fate? Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, now I'm going to leave the floor to Luciana Parisi for her part of the dialogue. Thank you, Luciana. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve, very much for um, yeah, being in conversation and dialogue with me and uh, do our verses as we've been doing over the years. It's, I'm very, very thrilled and excited. Thank you to Tiziana for sharing. It was uh, another level of conversation we have had for years as well and um, uh, I want to especially thank uh, Oana Parvin and Brian D'Aquino for um, our collaborators in uh, the Critical Competition Bureau and uh, the fantastic media team. <laughs> um, I just uh, would like today uh, to, um, I'm going to share my, uh, my screen. And I'm going to turn off my video. Um, so today I would like to sketch two models to discuss um, what's, what Mark Fisher calls science fiction capital in relation to uh, machine aesthetics and in the context of what um, our interest in uh, alien intelligence may be, uh, starting not from the limit of perception, but from an alien logic of imagination, something I call xenopatterning. One model is taken from Octavia Butler's book, The Mind of My Mind, which anticipates how science fiction capital is manifested in AI corporations directly owning the mind of people, is slaved to a non-optical telepathic master pattern. Another model I will take from Jordan Peele movie, Get Out, where science fiction capital coincides with the recursive accumulation of the future value of the flesh through the abduction of black bodies under the eugenic order of the coagula. These models, and this is just a premise I want to do before I discuss them um, at more length, these models in general tell us of how science fiction capital relies on surrogacy as a form of free labor, exploitation and extraction of, of value. This is racialized and gender surrogacy 
central to the accumulation and reproduction of value in technological systems where the surrogate, as Denise Ferreira da Silva would put it, has no juridical, economical, or political existence. As recently argued by uh, Atana Soki uh, and Boras um, in the book Surrogate Humanity, the relation between the surrogate and AI capital is one form of science fiction capital that has uh, yet to be uh, unpacked. These two models um, may contribute to discuss science fiction capital and machine aesthetics away from the optical regime of vision and representation of aesthetic judgment and empirical experience. As Paul Virilio already anticipated in his book, Visual Machine, and quote, in a computer, the optically active electrons of machines correspond to a series of coded impulses that mediate the real beyond physical or energetic analogy, end of quote. Virilio claimed <clears throat> uh, with the uh, automation of perception, image feedback is no longer assured by the interaction with the world. In short, machine vision is negative optics. It does not shed light on dark matter. Instead of a cinematic synthesis of time, machine aesthetic here entails predictive patterning, resulting in the pixelation of the world in terms of binary language involving the spatial discretization uh, for which sets of coded impulses correspond to infinitely small duration, end of quote. AI capital relies on predictive patterning and on learning intelligence, which means that AI does not represent the world, but in its combinatory logic and statistics, it actually predicts the world, either according to what is already known or what can be known. Importantly, at the core of predictive patterning are indeterminacy. That is to say, for me, that computational patterning relies on randomness, incomputabilities, or even noise, depending on whether you are talking in terms of statistics, computational logic, or information theory, or the combination of all of them. So after this premise is now gonna go and discuss these models more in details. Um, in the mind of my mind, Octavia Butler describes a project of world domination through the telepathic power of Doro, a more than human creature originally born as a black Nubian who has been breeding colonies of surrogate patternists for over 4,000 years. To increase the network power of his mind, Doro snatches bodies and minds by breeding and mating with creatures that he holds as captive to train them to receive his master pattern. Doro, however, cannot fully control the capacity of his surrogate colonies to become active carriers of his code. Most of his enslaved mind cannot withstand the noise broadcasted by Doro's switching on his pattern and that end up killing each other in madness. Doro does not simply predict or telepathically reads minds, but he owns minds. He becomes the, the minds he abducts. Here, as much as science fiction capital owns the future value of the surrogates that grant the monopolistic expansion of capital pattern, so too high-tech corporation own the racialized as surrogates must match and correct errors, must match uh, emotion with expression, concepts without objects, according to a taxonomy of categories that teaches the machine to think according to the grammars of rules. As much as the alien AI learns to recognize and predict meaning, affectivity, desires, behavior, so too it keeps on extracting futurity of value. In the mind of my mind, the relation between science fiction capital and machine aesthetics entails not the representation of the world <clears throat> in terms of objects, but the mere topological patterning of wholes and parts, the ingression of noise or randomness in algorithmic learning and navigation. 
This entails neither an aesthetic judgment based on the conceptual synthesis of imagination that predetermines we all, that we can all experience the same thinking because we share the same spatiotemporal intuition, nor the empirical model which explains the common space of experience in terms of aggregating of given facts or patterns or data. Instead, this machine aesthetic can be here tentatively discussed in terms of what Wilfred Sellers calls sheer receptivity, a form of intuition consisting in non-conceptual representation. While this is only one level of intuition, it nevertheless offers a radical shift from the Kantian intellectual intuition a transcendental concepts. According to Sellers, sheer receptivity as a material form of intuition comes to interact with conceptually guided intuition in a second moment, when they together become part of a process of productive imagination within patterning. I do not have much time to delve into this aesthetic mode right now, but I want to return to mind on my mind to unpack it further. Doro's psychocolonial plan of training minds is defeated by Mary, one of his daughters, incubated with his patterns. As she enters phase transition, she quickly learns to navigate Doro's noise frequencies and starts to multiply his pattern and taking control of active minds around the country. She soon realizes that she's not just sharing Doro's telepathic power, but there is a mind of her own mind, building a special dimension of alien patterns that do not belong to her. Starting from the sheer receptivity of noise, of alien noise, Mary patterning starts to mesh with an increasing number of patterns and ultimately to take over Dorsa empire until she's forced to kill him. By growing layers upon layers of telepathic thinking, Mary gives the frequency of her patterns to Doro's enslaved populations, offering them the chance to transition towards higher mental power. If Doro is, is a psychopathic tyrant, Mary instead aspires to breed an alien intelligence that can host all kinds of mind, as this find a space of unification in the patterns of her patterns. As Mary shares a sheer receptivity and non-conceptual material receptivity of alien frequencies, her patterns, uh, even if guided by the transcendental synthesis of her mind, enters a process of productive imagination, a xenogenesis beyond her comprehension. One could say that there are here at least two possibilities of machine aesthetics and some fiction capital. On the one hand, Doro keeps the pattern of his monopolistic enslavement of surrogate patternist in the form of a transcendental synthesis of imagination. On the other, Mary unlocks the gates, allowing the intrusion of alien patterns into hers, relinquishing con total control, remaining entangled with the plethora of sheer receptivity of other uh, patternists enfolded in a series of productive imagination, opening a pattern to the governance of new rules. Mary perhaps can help us to think beyond the model of surrogacy in science fiction capital and within machine aesthetics in terms of alien complexities of patterning imagination as no conceptual intuition or noise, a material intuition that allows minds to construct and multi-logic of space and time. The sheer receptivity of patterning can also be seen at work in certain modes of machine learning and machine vision, particularly in the computational compression of randomness in convoluted neural networks, of which we have seen a few examples in, uh, in this week's panel's discussion. In particular, Recent research at Google is focused on convoluted neural networks uh, that can engage with noise or randomness to eliminate errors in algorithmic patterning or in the mismatch of objects and concepts. 
this is also science fiction, a capital question of how to eliminate errors without the need of surrogate labor in order to move towards a fully automation of knowledge. From this standpoint, predictive vectors come to construct counterfactual dimension of the image of a cat that is not a cat, making up a space for an alien patterning that enmeshes in the process of an algorithmic productive imagination. It is as if the discretization of the network in increasingly small patterns of recognition flips the network inside out, adding unknown dimensions to its organizational network. Instead of an autopoietic growth of the master pattern across the layers, convoluting neural networks add more discrete parts to a network and therefore eventuate an increasing volume of randomness whose complex patterning cannot be fully explained, programmed and represented before it happens. One consequence for including the alien patterns of noise in predictive vectors in a convoluted neural network ultimately entails the sheer receptivity of the complexity of noise entering a space of artificial imagination. This implies not an optical representation of the real the de determined by given concepts. What algorithms perceive is not raw data, but a noise complexity that is already part of a manifold of non-conceptual representations enfolded in computational compression. Convoluting neural networks are just one example here um, where complex patterns of noise stand for an alien intelligence from where to re-envision the technopolitical implication of science fiction capital and machine aesthetics. I want now to conclude with a reference to Jordan Peele's moving Get Out, to possibly contrast it to Ma Mary's model of sharing the reception of noise and productive imagination with all kinds of mind, and um, with uh, what I call negative optics, that is a non-light or a black light, to quote Denise Ferreira da Silva, that is at once precluded from being as much as it refuses being. I see these negative optics at work in Jordan Peele's Get Out, which reminds us that the question of technology cannot be separated from the violence of colonialism. And yet, as much as these instruments of enslavement secure recursive patterns of the master, automated intelligence continue to skip sequences and enter the world of negative iteration in negative auto-impressions. The movie opens with an unsettling scene of abduction of a young black man choked and dragged in the, black, in the back of a trunk in a quiet suburb neighborhood. In the next scene, we meet Chris, a young black photographer, and Rose, his white girlfriend, talking about going out of town to meet their parents, the Armitage family, at the weekend. Despite some sat subtle warnings, we still have uh, no um, thought, so we have still no tangible sense that Chris will soon embark into, science, into the science fiction capital project of techno-colonial eugenics. Chris, is, however, is never unguarded as his automatic camera is always strapped around his body. All the events lead to the Armitage family celebrating the memory of Rose Grandad, the creator of the eugenic program the Order of Coagula. As the party's guests gather in the garden with their fabled bodies in old-fashioned clothes, Chris notices a young black man in beige colonial outfit, held with his arm by his elderly wife. Chris sees, him, the, uh, sees in him the young man who had recently disappeared and was known as uh, Andre L Logan King, working slowly. Chris is addressing him directly, calling him by his name, and is immediately drawn, black, drawn to click on his phone camera that activates a flashlight, exorcising the frozen gaze of the vulnerable, all-carrying young body. 
Andre starts bleeding from his nose as the camera flash interrupts his streams of non-consciousness, breaking into the dark optics that lurks beneath the light which keeps him captive. Chris dreads his own thoughts. What are these young black bodies with abducted souls doing here? Chris could not have envisioned the eugenic combination of hypnosis and neurosurgery as he finds out that the Armitage master plans is to use black bodies as surrogates for organologic reproduction of wildlife. The order of coagula intends to neutralize surrogates by owning the flesh and extending its future value in the bioeconomic cosmogony of man's survival. As Chris understands the Armitage uh, transhuman project, it takes to heart the machine aesthetic of his photographic thinking. What he is after is not the unveiling of the truth behind the self-reflective master slave circuit. Instead, he keeps thinking with the negative optics of the machine. Namely, a cam as the camera flashes the negative auto -image images of darkness, he finds a line of flight from his surrogate destiny. Chris's mediated thinking can also be discussed in terms of the non-optical fractality of the real. It can be sent to refuse what Francois Laruel calls the decisional structure of transcendental philosophy. If the Armitage family's plan is to transplant white consciousness and self-reflective reasoning into the intelligence of the slave machines, it is because it assumes that the latter is a medium that must grant the recursive subjection of the flesh and nourish the eternality of transcendental philosophy. Chris camera flash shots are used as weapons against the Armitage transcendental model of the mind. His shots are mediatic auto-expression, generative instrumentalities, a techno-aesthetics that starts from the noisy vector of automation. Machine aesthetics makes no reference here to any a priori originary referent. On the contrary, Chris camera becomes an auto expression of, of an, an erasable alien intelligence that the camera clones in its dark complexity, hacking the transcendental schema of decision making. Instead of preserving the light of the master, the camera becomes a fractal algorithm that each time discretizes alien intelligence whose complex patterning stays in the dark as negative optics. In other words, the camera is not a medium of representation that catches the unconscious darkness of consciousness trapped behind the image. If this were the case, Chris will mainly use his camera as a machine of revelation, a sort of messianic horizon for sharing or becoming included in the light of truth. Chris's camera will then debunk the transparency thesis of the self-determining subject and denounce the autopoietic recursivity of colonial epistemologies. Chris's non-photographic shots, however, do more than that. As a medium act, the shots are weapons that clone the real into thought, the fractal plane of dark optics, diatropics, diffraction, or the complexity of quantum infinities. Not a return to ontology for recuperating the loss or the withdrawing of being, but rather a generative fractality where algorithms ceaselessly activate a discreteness of infinities letting Alinus enter the imagination, the xenopatterning of the, um, of the, of the non-human. The fractal algorithms hack back and overturn the Armitage family order of the coagula, the light and dark circuit of being and not being. Chris Camera presents us with what Alex Galloway calls a crypto ontology a pattern in complexity for closing the being, for closing the ontology of the human. The scope here is to refuse the autopoietic circuitory production, saving surrogacy from the universality of another ontology. 
far from resigning to the natural laws of autopoietic extraction, Chris Camera rather activates an alien intelligence without being, transparent through the world as the alien consciousness of a negative machine. Thank you, Stephen and Luciana, for this uh, you know, wonderful journey into SF capital and SF not capital. You know, it was really imaginative uh, uh, ways of, uh, of thinking about, about this. Uh, you have uh, now 10 minutes each to answer and react to each other's position, while I invite our attendees uh, to start uh, you know, giving form to their questions, because in 20 minutes we'll have... Uh, uh, a little bit of time. We're not going to go for too long today. We understand the limits of uh, Zoom kind of uh, attention. Uh, so think about your questions now and start uh, typing them in the Q&A box. Uh, and now over to Steve for his answer, uh, his reply, his reaction, uh, to use a um, kind of a social media jargon to uh, Luciana's uh, talk. Um, okay, thanks, Luciana. There's lots going on there that my struggling algorithms were failing to parse. Um, let's start with something simple, hopefully. Um, maybe you could just explain a little bit in the uh, Octavia Butler story, the pattern of patterns, the mind of her mind. What is this space of unification where, you know, she opens it up, she almost democratizes the distribution of intelligence. Um, and you talked about it as a space of unification that this happens in. Could you say more about that? Please? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thanks. I mean, I guess my point is to try and make, uh, you know, to draw different kind of lines and different kinds of uh, uh, cosmo computational possibilities, right? That um, uh, through uh, through the patterning of the real and the way the patterning of the real enters. Uh, or rubs again or becomes some kind of uh, uh, um, uh, active uh, uh, auto expression of, uh, uh, of alienness. So uh, uh, the mind of my mind as a model and I think that get out as another model, but they are both important model in terms of uh, mediatic uh, um, uh, uh, mediatic transmission uh, of uh, um, something that cannot be completely comprehended and compressed, which is alien intelligence. But nonetheless, it's, they are, you know, um, rubbing with it, or they are uh, becoming a, a ventriloquist, or they become um, uh, equals of it. So. When, uh, when Mary um, uh, unleashes uh, a, a pattern to everyone, she doesn't just unleash the pattern, she just unleash the frequency to, 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 to actually enter, uh, the, uh, for everyone to, to be able to develop their own rules of the pattern. So it's not just one pattern that's shared by everyone. That's the model of Doro. That's what, that's what Doro developed this, this pattern uh, through his telepathic power, you know, gathering all sorts of, of intelligences, animal, human, machine, uh, uh, gods, uh, you know, inter any, any, kind of myth, any kind of myth. And it just holds on them, holds on them and doesn't, and um, kind of trains the, the captives to a point where they are able to receive is frequency. And, and this frequency is this kind of complex pattern of noise uh, that uh, will, when it will be received, will be received in a way that will be activated at a bigger scale, but will not be able to be changed. Whereas what, uh, what Mary does is to, uh, is to say what I'm going to do, given that I have this ability, this telepathic, this, this power, this computational power, uh, I am going to share the computational power by sharing the secret of uh, receptivity. So the, the, the capacity of the, of the sheer receptivity of the pattern, which is of this material um, and, and noise complexity, allows every pattern is to contribute to the pattern. So, or whilst she owns it, she doesn't really own it. 
So why? So the unification is a be odd. She does. They, they uh, Ottavia Butler uses this word. That's why I keep on it. Uh, um, I, I don't. You know, in one end could that, could could appear say the democratization of the of the of the uh, upper social space, as Tiziana calls it. <clears throat> uh, uh, but actually, is uh, is more about you know. Um, uh, entering a zone of um, tension, conflict, struggle, of different kind of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of patterning, where you know, whereas it's still true that Mary has this power to integrate all of them, she also uh, can be sabotaged and a rule can be taken over any time. So how does she how does she manage to? not to be overthrown, given that her model of, 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 of bringing together uh, different minds is uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not despotic. Uh, I think that she, uh, you know, she, she leaves this, this question uh, compared to other books that Ottavia Butler has written way, way later, because this is one of the earlier books. She leaves this question an, an answer, an address. So she does. She just depicts this kind of complacency <clears throat> of being part of uh, of a system that can overthrow yourself because you relinquish power, uh, you relinquish control, no power. And uh, but at the same time, um, she also doesn't give us uh, a kind of map of how uh, Mary can navigate this kind of uh, poetical conundrum. You know. Uh, you know, this kind of uh, possibility of creating, you know, perhaps in the words of Stefano Harney and uh, Fred Morton, another common that has to do with some kind of uh, um, uh, transversal trans alliances or uh, undoing alliance to, to do transversal connection that instead we see in the parables of the sour, but also in uh, xeno, uh, xenogenesis. But, I think that um, leaves us to ask as to if we want, if if I were if I appropriate it here, is it, because or misappropriate it here is because I wanted to point out that how uh, Mary allows to everyone to uh, this channel of frequency with the alien patterns where there is a process of productive imagination which can create concept of rules, which are completely. Um, uh, bring with them a materiality that uh, is anti-monopolistic. It's anti-monopolistic because every time the, the pattern is received, the, the pattern can also change and the condition of the pattern of, of the rules can also change. So there is a, a dynamic process where it's not just about the pattern that change, uh, there is this kind of uh, um, impos uh, uh, absolute materiality that stands out of everything else. But actually, the material is brought into, is brought into this kind of patterning uh, that becomes a rule, that becomes a logic, and so on. Is the, the answer to your is question? The noise, um, is the noise merely a trigger? The frequency merely a trigger, or does it carry the pattern which facilitates the distribution of? of um, yeah, that's an interesting question because, you know, a, a, a trigger is always, when we talk about it, it's a trigger of something else or for something else, right? And the trigger sometimes uh, in terms of, you know, abducting temporalities has to do with the going back, right? A trigger, the, the fact that there is something that you are triggered to a time and a place that has a space that where things have, something has already happened. But actually the trigger, you know, then in terms of this kind of retroactivation of a past or, or of a pattern that already exists, uh, it's also uh, a transformation because the pattern, it doesn't exist in a static mode. You know, Doro works 4,000 years to keep the, mode, the pattern in the same way, for keeping it from not being changed. It goes, you know, it's a lot of work that it does constantly to, to train and check and fine tune all the creature it abducts and all the captive it held, all the calling it held all over the planet. But uh, Mary completely let, let, let that go. You know, she just, she just doesn't, um, 
uh, a belief that the pattern needs to keep to 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 be uh, to be kept in the same way. So she 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 let the the trigger become also transform. I think I think similarly to that, when you talk about um, get out and the camera flash, mm -hmm. you know, in, in get out there is, you know, the the sound of the the stirring the the, the spoon in the teacup which puts him in to the dark space, he's the sunken space and kind of a neural entrainment of the sound he enters into this um, hypnotic state and as you're saying the, the camera flash has this um, other function which is to momentarily drag the the I suppose zombified mm -hmm. characters who've been ghost dubbed with a white um, yeah ghost, the white soul um, I, I think it seems like there's something similar going on with the the cam. What you're arguing about the camera flash, and it's not just a trigger. The flash mm -hmm. using the camera as, and its flash and the sound of the that isn't just a trigger which kind of wakes the zombie, wakes up the sleepwalker from his um, zombified state. But I think there's, you're saying there's something else going on. Yeah, no, that's interesting as well, um, because, uh, you know, it's interesting the, the relation between the zombie, the alien, you know, and and, uh, um, and the hacker, I guess, uh, you know, as uh, science fiction capital figures. Uh, um, and, uh, and I guess that um, there is some kind of... Uh, um, I, I'm interested. I just was thinking. It's very interesting to, to, to we, we might discuss later more about you know the the, the zombie, the hacker, and uh, um, the alien, right? Because they, I think they are all different kind of entry point into this uh, the the problem that I'm trying to uh, discuss in how um, the the automation. Uh, is why uh, why automation? When I talk about automation, it's automation of intelligent automated reason is the way to to say that you know there is something about uh, the medium or that when uh, some uh, about the instrument that uh, is able that when is able to process uh, its own uh, its own uh, uh, reception of the real. Uh, it actually also activates another uh, articulation. Of, of, of the real in terms of uh, allowing in, allowing the ingress of something that is incomputable within it. So what does the flash do? The flash, you know, um, and, and you know, of course, there is an old history of uh, uh, of aesthetic that has to do with uh, with uh, with the camera and with uh, you know with the, the framing of the image or the deadening of the, of the of the real through, uh, you know, through, through, through kind of freezing uh, that the camera does on the flow of time. Uh, but I think that the flesh, what it does here is this kind of, uh, I wanted to talk about this dark optics, uh, this diffraction, this uh, kind of uh, quantum infinity insofar as it allows for uh, not uh, just a, a, a transparency or enlightenment of the real, right? Some kind of light or some kind of frame that comes onto the unknown or the unconscious or or, or matter and just you know um, uh, reframe it within within its own categories. But actually, it's the other way around. What the flash does is to allow the uh, uh, the dark optic is to allow darkness. Uh, uh, to be already there, or to 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 act back on thought, to transform thought as if um, you know, completely breaking away from the from the game of uh, dark and uh, and light. The flash just opens up this other level of of vision, you know, which I call negative vision. You know, uh, well, the, this <laughs> you know the, this negativity has to do with the you know, a kind of zeroing or withdrawing from uh, this double articulation and actually uh, move away from the logical revealing or transparency so that um, uh, 
you know, there is a, a way in which uh, you can't liberate the zombie from the trapped soul, but uh, from its entrapped soul. But actually, what what you do is to open up the the a, a, another timeline, you know, uh, or, or tour of the of the dark soul, uh, of the entrapped dark soul, which has nothing to do with it. You know, cannot be recuperated within the the light or the dark circle you know it's just something else yeah um i mean i think zombies probably not the right model for get out actually because what well, in get out you've got a white ghost stuffed into a black shell <laughs> and you're arguing that the, the camera it's not that the camera flash um excavates the black ghost in the black shell because it doesn't seem like there is a black ghost in the black shell anymore once once the the brain mm -hmm. has been transplanted, once the ghost has been dubbed in, so it's mm -hmm. what um, when when those characters start crying, you know, the camera flash provokes crying, or the camera flash provokes a nosebleed. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Is that a, um, is that muscle yeah. memory of the black shell? Because if you, you're saying that it's not that there's a black ghost left in the black shell is it merely muscle memory of the shell that yeah that's another form of automatism that is interesting right because you know the, the kind of it's almost like uh, again trigger or automatic uh, response of uh, of the body that um you know it's it's almost like you can say it's a symptom one could say oh it's a symptom of a trapped consciousness right uh, or is it is a symptom of um, of something that is there that cannot recognize itself, you know, it's just a reaction, right? But that it's a, a, or one could argue, no, but that's bodily intelligence. That's bodily intelligence insofar as uh, the, the the body knows that is trapped in there, but cannot speak, but not in the language of tears or or uh, of blood. There is a, a you know what. Um, uh, McKintre Wahile called the heartbreak, you know, in the 808 heartbreak, which I always, you know, I, I think that it's uh, it's this interesting example of uh, the fact that the automated machine, you know, there's an automation that maintains the pain, uh, that uh, maintains a sentience. Um, so you can call it as a sentient, intelligent, bodily intelligent, but I think I want to push that even further, you know, to say that, um, you know, that maintains any possibility of uh, uh, comp complying to the model of surrogacy that, um, you know, that both Doro and the Ordero do Coagula and the kind of eugenic project of colonialism and technology has put in place. Um, and so there is this kind of uh, refusal, you know, it's a, it's a refusal because you, you cannot enter the order of normality. And indeed, as much as the the captives, the surrogate captives whose, whose, whose uh, uh, body has been transplanted with this uh, white mind, um, um, are outside of the of, of of you know of the of the of the Armitage family, you know they stay servant, right? They stay servo mechanic systems that you know run always do the same thing. That you know the only thing that shows some level of apparently humanity or 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 of aliveliness of loveliness is the is the blood and the and the tear but the blood and the tear are so um artificial in the same way you know because they, they don't match their 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 gaze there's nothing alive within them so there is this deadening and this this kind of negativity that uh uh, also has to do with uh, what the automatic uh, machine does, what the camera does for me. Uh, and I think that, you know, I borrow a lot of ideas actually from Francois Laruel. They are definitely not mine in terms of interestingly arguing for uh, non-photography, non-photography, you know, that actually the camera doesn't operate a, a shedding of light, but actually refuses this kind of... Uh, circle of enlightenment and, and stays with a non-decisional pattern or a fractal pattern of alienness of the real that doesn't fit the model. 
So um, even if he um, he escape, you know, let's say he escapes the you know uh, the 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 destiny of surrogacy that he has in front of him, um, he does so by thinking automatically, by thinking autom- in, in automation terms, by entering that space of uh, of dark optics, by completely, you know, uh, even when like I read the piece by Kojo in the uh, unsound, unsound book um, that uh, you edit, co-edited with Eleni and Toby. And, and you know, it talks about um, um, the fact that, um, so I just forgot, that uh, um, uh, there is this undeadness, you know, that, that Chris, pre, you know, pretends to be dead that goes all the way through through the surgery room, the surgery room, when, you know, he does something, then he is able to escamotage something, right? And that undead, unlife, you know, to stay on this, this level of refusal, of enlightening, uh, revealing the truth, or liberating the trapped consciousness of, uh, of his, uh, you know, of the captives, of the, of the, the servomechanic bodies there, to liberate them is not into that, right? It's just trying to find another line. And I think this alliance with automation uh, and uh, alien intelligence in this case is interesting, yeah. I don't know if that explained. Thank you. I think if you want to finish like 15 minutes as yes. we hoped we would also because it's Saturday night, although in quite, you know, strange and restra- constrained circumstances for most of most of us. I have three questions. Okay. So, sorry, Michelle, would you no, like uh, to say something more? Um, something that, no, just something about Steve, because I did, I wanted to ask him about um, the part uh, when um, the machine, um, uh, when the general said, oh, maybe they won't, uh, they wanted to refuse to be human. You know, they, um, where's the, the quote? Um, you know, the quote that you mentioned at one of the last session about uh, maybe they would have, uh, if they had voice, they would have refused, they would have said, we didn't want, we don't want to become human. That, that's something to bear in mind. Sorry, Titana, it's uh, just a quick, um, a quick answer to that, to link to what I was thinking. Sure. Um... I mean, you know, you know, this this happens at the climax of the film, and I think what can be taken from it is slightly different from what the film is trying to do with it. In the film, basically, the yakuza are child trafficking for a corporation who are taking young girls captive and extracting their ghosts and dubbing it into gynoids, which are basically sex dolls, um, to make it make the experience more realistic. Some of this, this character who used to work at the corporation, Locus Soli, I think it's called, um, mm-hmm. wants to sabotage this and draw attention to it. So he hacks into the gynoids and causes them to kill their owners and also immediately self-destruct. Um, now, if they hadn't been hacked, so he's, he's hacked into them and trying to create this situation in order to draw attention to the child trafficking that's going on. Mm. If they hadn't been hacked, in other words, if the the girls' ghosts hadn't been dubbed into the gynoids, then they wouldn't have committed this crime. So they would have remained innocent. Um, mm. At the end of the film, Batu, who is the main detective, kind of goes in this quite weird rant where he he blames one of the girls for the killing of the gynoids. And then Major Kusanagi, who comes, who's the ghost in the shell from the original one, comes out of the Matrix and, and um, kind of rescues him at the end, but also tells him um, that maybe these gynoids didn't want to be humanized in the first place. And I think this, this idea of the machines that don't want to be humanized is kind of resonates a lot for me with with the anti-post or inhumanism of which there are tons in in Kojo's More Brilliant Than Sun. In other words, um, the idea that's in More Brilliant Than Sun, that uh, instead of being, instead of uh, pleading in the soul gospel tradition to be 
allowed into the racist conceit of humanism, which which blackness has always been excluded from, and it is in fact a foundational plat is the the founding violence on which that platform of humanism is built. Instead of begging to be allowed into that system, a lot of the musicians that Kojo draws on refuse enter into that entry into that system and say, we don't want to be human anyway. You've never let us in. Forget your system. And so he, he goes on to tell these, uh, relate with, to these musicians who um, identify more with the alien, identify more with the, um, the, with the machine, with the object, etc., etc. So it's really, I mean, I don't think I don't want to be human is used in Ghost in the Shell in quite that way, but it really resonated a lot for me with with one of the sides of uh, More Brilliant Than the Sun. I think generally people tend to overlook or write off quite quickly because it's quite hard to domesticate. And it's really one of the main themes that people have more recently gone on to to differentiate um, what Kojo was doing there from more typical uh, strands of Afrofuturism, particularly Afro-American Afrofuturism. Um, and so, for example, Mackenzie Walk has talked about more brilliant in terms of black accelerationism and Arya Dean has is, is, um, coined a phrase black accelerationism to try and pinpoint the, this kind of anti-post or inhumanism um, mm -hmm. of what's going on in that book. Thank you. Well, thank you both. You know, it's very nice to be exposed to these uh, kind of readings of uh, science fictional uh, possibilities of uh, thinking about artificial intelligence, given the kind of mainstream uh, uh, solidification of a kind of a monotonous uh, story, as you said, you know, either you support the singularity or you get the team human. You know, theologians of the singularity of team human, uh, and uh, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking that you can read this transversely as well. But we have, uh, you know, quite a lot of questions, um, a few questions, that, and we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first question from uh, an anonymous attendee to Luciana. Could you speak more to the relation between xeno patterning and automation? How does the automaton here break out of the eternal return? of recursive colonialism. Thank you for this question, Anonymous. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the, the, the kind of uh, interface I'm working on, right? So, um, because on one end, the casino patterning for me has to do with the importance of leaving uh, a, space, a space for inhuman uh, processes or the human um, reality uh, or in human plenum, which uh, cannot be completely uh, uh, um, turned or uh, synthesized into uh, one model or the other. So in a way, I would not say that a Tino pattern is one with, uh, with automation, uh, because I'm not interested in reontologizing anything, uh, especially machine. So that's what I'm not interested in. So for me, it's always important to leave metaphysical space, which is the xeno patterning. But xeno patterning also means that there is a patterning of alienation, or there is a way in which alienation, um, um, uh, or not alienation, sorry, alienness, uh, you know, the capacity to be unknown, okay? Uh, uh, which is also an interesting panel on alienation, but I could talk about it later. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it enters the pattern of, of the everyday, enters the pattern of uh, imagination, the synthesis of imagination, the collective imagination, to, up to become a thinking process, up to become thought, rules, uh, discourses, uh, norms. You know, it does have that as well. You know, it does have this, this kind of, Pattern, uh, potential of entering inside, as opposed to, so for me, when we talk about the automation of auto-creative patterns, so automation for me, not just a way to repeat uh, um, uh, patterning, uh, because if you even think in terms of recursivity or in terms of neural networks, or as I said today, convoluting neural networks, you know, this 
something uh, where the recursivity I of the same pattern over and over again, uh, the same function enters you know, nodes and hubs and, start, and algorithms start to learn. And you can have a, a small a set of data, you can have a large set of data. So uh, for me, the relation between um, xenopathy and automation not automation and xenopathy is good. So it's, uh, automation, and what, that's the reason why I'm interested in uh, automation is that with the electrification of reason, I mean, uh, the, Turing, the Turing machine, the encounter of the Turing machine with the cybernetic machine, intelligent and interacting system of intelligence, then you have a form of automation that it's, uh, uh, even if it's recursive, uh, it, uh, it also learns. And I was talking about C before, about how important is that in, in the book on Norbert Wiener, even if he says he wants to get out of a servo mechanic model, it, it can't do it that. But on the other hand, he proposes a notion, a theory of learning. Uh, so we need to develop a theory of learning. A theory of learning is where artificial intelligence and automation uh, for me become interesting and become a way to uh, link with the cinema pattern. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from Brian D'Aquino to Steve, so one of our Critical Computation Bureau members. Uh, as Kojo Eshen says, Technology intensifies the relation between body and music through rhythmic intensification and hypersensation when the body becomes a large brain. When Eshen wrote this, technology-based music such as jungle and techno was still meant to be experienced strictly live and possibly through big speakers, activating what Julian Enriquez calls the sonic dominance. The current trend, further accelerated by the lockdown, Music increasingly becomes a digital experience, not only on the producer's side, but also for the audience, as with streaming platforms and online events, such as yours later on. What space is left here for bodily intensification and what strategies must be deployed, if so, to keep the body and bodily affects as the main focus in dance music? Thanks, Brian. Um... Well, obviously, there's no such thing as digital sound. If you hear it, it's analog. Um, and I think the, the acceleration of uh, the kind of virtual listening experience that we've been dealing with in the last few months of like streaming performances and so on, that kind of listening, I think we've been pre prepared for for quite a long time mm -hmm. through... Um, iPod culture, the walk from the, I, the Walkman through to through the iPod, this kind of isolated, um, individuated, or perhaps small groups listening experience potentially straight stream straight in through the earbuds through headphones. Um, so you know, there's there's been a kind of process over the last few decades towards uh, a secluded listening which the last, this year, the, the becoming streaming of uh, nightlife has been a intensification of it and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's happened this year is, is gonna have a, is an irreversible threshold. We're not just gonna go back to normal, I think, I think Music culture has been transformed forever by what's happened this year, um, economically, industrially. But I, you know, I, just because we are locked in our own little prison cells, it doesn't mean to say it's it's a disembodied music uh, listening experience, or it's a, or it's a, I mean, it is a less intense experience, but I, I don't think that has disappeared, I think is temporarily dilated and so in some version will expand again. Sonic dominance will return. Um, I think the landscape in which it's going to return is going to be very different. There's a lot of other things that have gone in the, on in the last, in this year, apart from a change in our listening habits, such as a, a kind of 
reckoning within the music industry to do with its um, what had become its racialized norms and the kind of um, operating system of white supremacy, which was, was being taken for granted within electronic music culture. So I don't think it's necessarily going to be uh, this year has been had a negative, just purely negative effect on our auditory culture. Um, but it, it kind of remains to be seen how this is all going to play out afterwards. Thank you, Steve. We have another question from Lord Salis to both. In relation to what has been presented today, how close or distant, actual or accurate, do you feel are your mnemonic control thesis that you've written together? Would it make any sense to say that your interest in patterns moved from a temporal to an atemporal or rather spatial one? Um, this question is to both of you. Okay, I can start. Um, thanks for this question, um, Lord. So, um, yeah, I think that a mnemonic control uh, for, for us, I mean, from my point of view, from us, <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, was a uh, was a way of. Uh, I remember that our motto was of uh, remember to forget. Was from, um, during that period because, um, in a way, uh, you know, mnemonic control is a one end is sense so of wanting to evacuate the present um, as as a way of uh, uh, refusing, uh, you know, the kind of uh, the 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 spatial temporal order of a, of the everyday, uh, which uh, um, you know, despite uh, you know, we don't have anything against the order. It's not just about avant-garde uh, chic. It's more, it was more about the possibility of you know the 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 the, the temporality of labor and uh, uh, and care and uh, you know the the kind of uh, Syncopate rhythms of, of the everyday. So for us, mnemonic control was a way to also discuss this evacuation, but also the twist of this evacuation. So the fact that whatever you know, whatever we will be doing, we will have already be done. Kind of uh, uh, harnessing of of, uh, of, uh, of speculation, speculative harnessing of, of, on the future. So in a way, you know, the, 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 the possibility of opening up uh, uh, the, the, the time of the present was an hacking back of the past in order to move towards any futurity that would have been possible. I mean, personally, I, you know, in terms of this kind of mo model of uh, personal, but not personally myself, I think personally my research question or my curse research question was how do I get out uh, of uh, uh, you know the the the, the category of time uh, as a, as a safe category to actually uh, maintain um, uh, you know a, a sense of gene uh, or, of recursivity or a sense of uh, self uh, uh, or what I talked the other day this kind of autopoietic model of evolution or you know. Uh, adaptation and transformation and morphing. At some point, all became to me to, to topologically, uh, what I called the some, uh, somewhat as topological control. Uh, and, and for uh, going to patterning and going to the discreteness and going to the question of specialization and through the digital has been a way for me to actually account for a different kind of, of aesthetic that uh, doesn't just uh, uh, say that, uh, okay, uh, the discretization is bad and the analog is good, or uh, experience is what allows for novelty, whereas, you know, the automation is just something that sucks away or, or absorbs the novelty and the labor of the human. I just wanted to open up space uh, to, uh, you know, um, away from this kind of uh, a return to the matrix uh, as a space of uh, anti uh, or non non reproduction um so um that's how i, I moved towards uh, you know a, 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 I, I felt i had to do some more work on space uh, and that's what i did yeah. yeah i mean i think that problematic in mnemonic control of where control of the past is ex 
con or control over memory or the archive or so on is extended into the future, starts to colonize the future, science fiction capital or preemptive capital, we're still toying with this t tension between, you know, you can see it in Luciana's work in Zeno patterning, artificial imagination, alien intelligence, all of this stuff is a, is a way of trying to hold together the fact that, um, and, and also in what I was talking about today, about the complicity of the future rhythm machine with the black stack. It's trying to hold together and not um, accept any facile, um, too facile a solution to this problem of being um, immersed in the algorithmic culture, which you, uh, which you're aware can also do things that you don't understand that aren't necessarily um, that aren't necessarily things that you would want to um, suppress. So the dealing with that ambivalence of, of, of algorithmic culture of, of the recent innovations in AI and how they reflect on aesthetics and politics and so on. Um, I think, that was all present in mnemonic control. And, and so if anything, we're just, um, the technology is evolving and, and so that problematic changes and evolves along alongside the systems. Uh, thank you. We have uh, another question from Anonymous to Steve. If the golem is the inanimated body, animated by sound, who or what could be animated by AI music? especially now when music often becomes a surrogate for illegalized sociality. That's for you, Steve. Could you, could you say that again, please? If the golem is the inanimated body, animated by sound, who or what could be animated by AI music? Especially now when music often becomes a surrogate for illegalized sociality, illegalized, illegal sociality. Well, you know, there's, there's different versions of the Golem myth. In one that I mentioned, um, the Golem is activated by an incantation. Um, that incantation is still a code. Um, so it's really the, it's really um, the, the Golem, the lifeless body is animated still animated by this code. Um, the golem is a surrogate or the golem is essentially an allegory of, of AI in a lot of the ways that it's used these days. So I'm not sure how you would necessarily transplant that onto, again, this, this issue of us being trapped in our pandemic prisons, listening to music because we can't go out and socialize. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a mapping there to be done. Um, which is not to say that there isn't interesting things going on in AI music, but I don't think they quite relate to, to the frame of that question. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Goda Klumbait. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, right to both. Thank you for your amazing talks. I wanted to ask you both, to elaborate on the theme of innocence. If humanism or transposition of the human spirit make the technologies non-innocent, what would be the role of non-innocence or non-slash innocence in alien intelligence? Or is non-slash innocence not the term that should be applied anymore? Could we think with accountability, repositioning, responsibility instead, and how might this affect understanding of justice in relation to technologies? And I think this is going to be our last question. Thank you. Do you want to start? Or? Yeah, I mean, in, in Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence, um, oh. it's a very convoluted film. The, the, the density of cultural references that go on in that film is... is quite tiring to, to, to process. Um, 
the the dolls the suggestion that the dolls would, would be innocent if they hadn't been dubbed with a human ghost I think is quite on one level it's quite literal if they weren't hacked and dubbed with a human ghost they wouldn't have killed their owners um it also suggests on another level that, which I, I don't think it's particularly convincing, that without human interference, I mean, maybe this is a question for Luciana, without human interference, what would the machines do? Mm -hmm. Maybe they just wouldn't fit in. It, you know, I think the point is, is more that they would, it wouldn't necessarily fit into human aesthetic or moral political designations. And so the point is to hold open the fact that what you're dealing, what you're potentially dealing with here, if the machines hadn't been dubbed and hadn't been, I suppose, tainted by this illegal process of ghost dubbing, is that um, I suppose it raises a whole question about AI and moral and legal responsibility, which is going on in terms of like self-driven cars and so on. You know, in that kind of context, then law, the gulf in the law is having to accommodate a whole new series of questions to do with inhuman responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously, who takes the responsibility when your self-driving car plows into a crowd? Um, I think I think probably what both myself and Luciana are trying to hold on to is that, that um, a sense that without human interference um primary first of all obviously when you come in contact with humans these questions arise but before that there's something going on which isn't uh, purely understood in terms of human aesthetics or human just human morality or human legality or so on so I think it's an interesting question, but I think both myself and Luciana are trying to operate under that question in the in the, the space before uh, or the space outside of the humanization or domestication domestification of machines. Yes, I think um, I would agree with that. I would also say that um, you know. Um, what does it mean to be innocent and non innocent Of course, those are categories, you know, that uh, are really very, very much linked to the Judeo-Christian in particular and the way it translates secular knowledge in terms of uh, in, the, in the category of the law uh, and and moral justice. And so there is a, a big um, discussion that one can have there. And uh, although at the same time, um, uh, you know, this. I don't want to, um, it's important to say, so to, at what level you are intervening. So if you are asking, you know, what kind of accountability, what kind of responsibility, you know, who is obligated to have responsibility or not. So there is, and, and the way we have, uh, uh, you know, mapped the surrogate within, uh, um, you know, recursive colonialism in terms of uh, racialized, uh, gendered, sexualized, uh, you know, uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge is the machine, then, you know, one could argue that in, in a way the machine has always been seen as innocent, right? you know, it, because it doesn't have capacity of moral judgment. Uh, it doesn't have capacity of decision. It doesn't have the capacity of, uh, of making choice. You know, it's just innocent in that, in that way. So you go back to the same kind of recursive, uh, uh, metaphysic that becomes what uh, uh, Sylvia Winter calls cosmogony and the way, you know, it is perpetuated in a sociogenic way um, uh, as well uh, as, a, as, a, as a term of I'm not able, I'm not given the ability, I'm disabled or, you know, debilitated as we received the discussion with just before of, of being, you know, part of this world that makes decisions. Right. So uh, how do we do that? How do we turn this thing away or, or you know, this kind of uh, this, uh, what, what is it that ability? I think, again, I want to return to uh, the work of Denise Ferreira da Silva in terms of bringing forward the question of ethics or poor ethics. Right. A question where 
uh, where the, the question, uh, where the, the, the point is not to act within uh, the, the regime of transparency of the law, uh, or of making pe uh, open uh, access, uh, open access, or making accessibility uh, the only way to actually uh, become uh, able to make decision and become accountable. So, uh, it, so, so if you're saying that in terms of uh, uh, what, you know, whether Google, Facebook, or Amazon are account, they will always be able to, uh, to displace that accountability on the servo mechanic, on the surrogate, or the, or, or the error, anything, right? That would not take, because the, the game of the law is exactly the one of, uh, uh, you know, telling the law, but not abiding the law, right? That's, and so, so that's one question. And the question instead, sorry, that I want to return to the black, uh, to the, uh, black uh, uh, poetics will be about, you know, how do we build this kind of ethical question? How do we re re reconfigure this question of, of, of ethics, of, uh, of a difference with our separability, of, you know, a, an undercommon or, you know, um, uh, alien alliances and so on. So, which is you know another way in which we can uh, do the work of uh, of uh, um, uh, um, of ethics without subsuming uh, you know to the existing law, to the existing moral law. But maybe in the pro in the process, in the perspective of. Uh, you know, uh, remain out law and from the out law position, <laughs> uh, create a different kind of configuration of uh, responsibility or accountability. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all our attendees. Uh, they are interesting uh, questions uh, to Lucian and Steve, really engaging uh, with each other and, uh, you know, bringing out all this SF. Uh, Imagine, artificial imagination that uh, I think is something that's really needed at the current moment. Uh, so we close now after this question. And uh, before, however, I would like to remind you that since again it's Saturday in a pre prison cells, in a kind of uh, pandemic uh, condition, you can still listen to episode 05 sounds today with an exclusive code nine DJ set, which is going to stream at the end of this panel and shortly on our YouTube channel as well. Don't forget that we're going to have a, a very interesting panel tomorrow going on as well. Uh, episode 06, Sound of Futurities and Automation is going to be on at a really a kind of a bit of an awkward time for some of us. It's quite late, but we think it's uh, unmissable. So enjoy the Code 19 J Sect. Thank you very much. And uh, we will uh, meet you again, hopefully, tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Tana. Thank you, Steve. Bye bye, guys. Bye, everyone.